What up everybody and welcome to Baz on Blades. My name is Baz and I talk about blades and tonight we're going to do an extremely serious video. This is very serious to Baz on Blades and it should be to everybody out there. Do not laugh at this video. It's very serious. You have my word on that. What we're going to talk about tonight is Lockism. Lockism has been rearing its ugly head in the knife enthusiast community. And you're asking, Baz on Blades, what is Lockism? I need to know in order to recognize it. Well, what Lockism is, is judging a knife solely based on the type of lock it has. It is extremely closed-minded, and there is no place for it in the knife enthusiast world. I'm going to root out Lockism. I want everybody to join with me. We're going to hashtag this up. We'll be on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And oh, wait a second. I can't do Facebook. I just deleted my Facebook page. Um, well, you guys are on your own fighting Lockism on Facebook. Um, <laughs> Let's get serious and actually talk about locks. I've got an array of lock types out here on the table that I'm going to run through here. Uh, different variations on lock types, and I, I haven't even shown you a knife yet. So let's go ahead and pull something in because we're going to start with liner locks. And what I've got here is an old school 2000 era bench made Elishwitz design striker. This is a folding knife, liner lock, uh, titanium liner lock. Uh, it's on phosphor bronze bushings, G10 handle scales. It's, it's just an old school bench made. And it is a liner lock, okay? And what we mean by liner lock is you've got the metal liners that are underneath the handle material. And, and this liner is slit and... Uh, Part of that is bent and it works as an interference type of lock with spring action to put it into place and keep it into place uh, along with a very fine fitting at the uh, juncture here, the locking juncture, the lock face at the blade tang. Um, there is a very fine fitting uh, involved in liner locks. And like I say, this is circa 2000. Uh, we are going to talk about some positives and negatives of all the locks that I've got out here. And we're going to start out on a big negative here. Uh, it's a titanium liner lock. Now, I've talked about this before. For those of you that have been into knives and tactical uh, knives in uh, particular... Uh, since the late 90s, early 2000s, you will know exactly what I'm talking about because you lived through this. Uh, liner locks before that time were um, crap. I didn't carry anything for liner locks. They were not using or having um, <clears throat> even the access to the most of basic technologies that we use now as far as manufacturing. Liner locks back in the day were clunky, stainless steel uh, sheets that were roughly stamped, roughly, guys. Um, and liner locks were troublesome. They were troublesome. The, a lot of manufacturers had a hard time with setting up the locks to where they were strong, <clears throat> excuse me, and reliable. Now, um, we started seeing sort of a renaissance in liner locks around the uh, 98, 99, 2000 time frame. And then you had um, some American companies like Benchmade and you had Emerson Knives uh, that were pushing liner lock builds. And they brought those builds into the future with a newer type of manufacturing techniques. They were using um, wire EDM and, and water jet cut, and, and, and I don't know exactly what they were using in that time frame, guys. Um, I think these were wire EDM cut is what they were. And um, they could do a much more precise liner lock cut. They also were selling these knives at a higher price point. It allowed them to do a lot more hand 
fitting on the knives. The reputations of brands like Benchmade were made in those years. That's the coattails that the modern brand Benchmade rides on, the knives that were built back in this time frame. They were really pushing barriers at that time as far as increasing precision and quality, repeatability, consistency in manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> so liner locks sort of moved ahead in time and got a little more precise. And on the knives where uh, you were seeing them in the higher end, they were working very well. Now you started seeing titanium come in as a liner lock material uh, by these same brands. Titanium was the new thing. Now it's everywhere in knives. But back then, it was the new thing. Not everything had titanium in it uh, back in the day. So as a new material, they were still on a learning curve with it. And one of the things that they found out was an issue with titanium liner locks is um, the difference in the hardness between the hardened blade steel and the much, much, much softer titanium. Titanium cannot, cannot be hardened as hard as blade steel. Uh, there is at least... Uh, even with beta titanium, which has a very high hardness capability for titanium, it's still more than a 10-point spread uh, just to get up to your common uh, blade steels, things that we think is entry-level, like your 440C, your AUSA, your uh, HCR, uh, steels like that that are just the beginnings of high-carbon stainless steels. There's still much, uh, a huge difference. So you started seeing wear. You had a lot of problems out of titanium liner locks, guys. There was a learning curve. Titanium is soft. It wears. It also has impact deformation. It's not as hard. Under impact, it will deform. Um, anything that you would put pressure on the back of a blade of a early titanium liner lock, it would mushroom that liner lock, that engagement area. And then you'd get all kinds of blade play and lock rock and just there was, guys, there was tons of problems with all the brands that were doing titanium liner locks. Um, <clears throat> So, liner locks started falling out of favor. You know, uh, there was a little bit of, you know, some issues that were spread across. Nobody wanted to go back to clunky old steel liners. Everybody wanted to push uh, technology and push material. This is where really the higher end, the aerospace type materials really started coming in the late 90s, early 2000s. <clears throat> so they wanted to keep on with that, keep on with that. It's got to be bigger and better and newer and harder and faster and lighter and stronger. So liner locks started going away. But there was sort of a, a, a liner lock that came along, and I don't know when it came along. I'm not an expert, and I missed that spidey flick. But I'm redoing that. I'm redoing that, guys. Okay, there we go. So anyway, uh, Spyderco came along and we've got this compression lock. And before all you guys go crazy and say compression lock's not a liner lock, yes it is. It is a highly modified liner lock. Um, what a compression lock does is add um, a strength, in my opinion, I'm not an engineer, I don't know the proper word, so if I sound like an idiot, uh, I come by it naturally. Um, it adds a, um, an aspect in the design that strengthens it. What it does is it's trapping this liner that it has moved, the, the locking bar, it's moved it from the inside of the grip to the back, first of all. And that changes the accessibility, of course. And then what they've done is they've moved it to the um, backstop side. So they have changed this lock design to lock up into a notch that is in the back of the blade. All right, this notch is going to come around. The blade tang is going to seat against the pin. The liner that is underneath the uh, pin is going to shoot across and fill that small area there. 
All right, so you have this, uh, the liner is pressing against the stop pin, uh, the blade is pressing against the stop pin, you've got the liner inside of that uh, notch that's cut out on the blade tang. Um, it focuses the locking area into a much stronger area where you're tying the blade itself, the stop bar here, the stop pin, and the lock bar. Uh, that makes for a stronger knife, but it is still sort of a liner lock. No issue there, guys. It, that's what it is. It's a lock. It's in the liner. It's a spring, and they changed it up, and it's stronger um, and a little more consistent than a, a regular liner lock, but it's still a liner lock. Now, the next thing we're going to move into is the problems we had with a liner lock. Um, you know, they, instead of... Um, refining the manufacturing there was a trend towards making the lock stronger uh, they basically took what you had in a liner lock and came up with the frame lock now I don't want to go into who we owe for the design of the frame lock uh, it's officially been two or three different guys um, there were some very cutting-edge designers in both um, high-end production and the custom world that were messing around with frame locks at the same time and what a frame lock is is uh, instead of having a liner on the inside of handle material you have a frame side of the knife that is solid metal and then they slot it and they bend it over into a spring uh, and it works just like a liner lock but it's way thicker and heavier than a liner lock. Um, let's go ahead and pull out a modern liner lock here. You can see how thick the liner material is compared to how thick the frame lock material is on this zero tolerance. Um, that was one of the good things about a frame lock. There is more area there, uh, there's more structural rigidity, and it is stronger in that respect. But everybody started doing frame locks in titanium, and the titanium steel is softer than the steel of the blade that it is made in up against. You still had the same problems that you had with titanium liner locks. Uh, the difference between the hardness level caused premature and excess wear. Um, impact could cause deformation. Um, you still had issues. Now, I have owned titanium frame locks, early titanium frame locks, uh, from very high-end manufacturers. One that I will mention is Strider Knives. Um, anybody that has been in the knife world knows uh, who Strider Knives are, and at one time there was no knife that was considered tougher than a Strider folding knife, as far as folding knives go. And what I had was an SMF that was the full size of that series in um, the CC model, the the curved, the milled handles, I think the CC was conceal carry or comfort carry or whatever it was. Uh, anyway, I had one. It was circa 2008, 2008, and I really liked that knife. It had some issues. It was super thick behind the edge. Uh, it's not a slicer. It was a cutter. Um, but it was a heavy, uh, mine was black G10, and then flame finished uh, bead blast titanium frame lock and it developed significant lock rock within months of carrying it and using it for just common use and unfortunately strider knives had developed a little bit of a reputation at that point for that problem and it was an ongoing issue with titanium titanium is soft guys you cannot harden it as hard as steel so there was a couple of um, uh, engineering fixes that came along one was you could carbonize you could take a carbonizing machine and basically weld micro particles of carbides onto the face of the frame lock and that gave a carbide to steel uh, contact point and it 
fixed a lot of wear issues. Now, it did not fix the impact deformation issue, but um, unless you're putting a lot of pressure or impact on the back of a blade, a lot of times that does not come into play. Um, and then the second thing that came along, uh, the my preferred technique is you see here this screw on the inside there is a, a milled pocket and there is a little puzzle piece shape uh, piece of hardened steel that is insert in there and the joiner between the blade tab here the blade tang the lock face on the blade and the frame lock is that steel insert you can plainly see that and what that does away with is the difference in the hardness causing the premature and excess wear it also mitigates to a certain extent uh, the impact deformation that you get with titanium frame locks now, you can also do frame locks in steel. You see that a lot on lower priced frame locks. And I, you know what? I don't have any issue with that. They're going to be heavier, but it's easy now that everything is CNC cut. You can set up an internal milling pattern on them and pocket mill them to get the weight down. And then you don't have to worry about with a hardened lock face or insert or carbidizing. You have steel on steel at that point. Uh, another good thing about a frame lock is this. Uh, you remember I said that early frame locks had issues uh, with fitting. And a lot of times on an early frame lock, it was easy to grip the knife hard and use it hard. And when you did, the flesh from your finger would go up and it would push the liner lock out of the way and the knife would become unlocked. Um, there was a thing back in the early days where you saw a lot of tabs, liner lock tabs, that were very proud to make them easy to use. Um, a combination of that and badly fit um, lock interfaces caused some issues. Now, with a frame lock, when you squeeze a frame lock, you are literally squeezing that lock into the lock position. In fact, I have had uh, poorly fit frame locks that you go and you do some heavy cutting and you've squeezed it hard enough where you've squeezed the lock bar all the way across the lock face. And then you've got to come in with a screwdriver or something and pry them apart. Um, so you do have that in sort of favor of a frame lock. So for that reason, and uh, you know, a combination of that and the thicker um, frame material, I prefer a frame lock over a normal liner lock. Um, now, the, the Spyderco compression lock, I, you know what, I prefer that over a regular liner lock as far as strength goes. Um, although, just like I showed with this uh, Kubi here, um, you know, modern liner locks are pretty good, guys. You've gone to CNC uh, machinery cutting these liners out, and they are very precise now, and we're getting an influx of fantastic frame locks. Now, or liner locks, I mean. So now we've got good liner locks, and we've got good frame locks. Um, now, uh, which which um, of those do I think is the best lock? Well, like I said, um, I prefer a frame lock for a couple of reasons, and I stated those where you're squeezing it and you squeeze the lock tighter. Uh, it's thicker and heavier. Uh, is it perfect? No, there's plenty of terrible frame locks out there, guys. And even a frame lock over um, a liner lock is still not my favorite lock at all. We'll talk about that last. Uh, here is another version of a frame lock. It's called a sub frame lock. And basically what it is, is a sub frame lock. Um, it's just a, it's just a damn frame. I have had so many conversations with people that want to call this something other than a frame lock. A sub frame lock is a frame lock. It's, you know, just a, a cut in portion, a sub 
subsended or subspended or sub well i don't know what proper usage word is i'm looking for but it's an inserted part that replaces a part of the frame that's cut out uh, you're cutting a piece out and replacing it with another piece that's the same just to say you've got a sub frame lock instead of a frame lock what that allows is this aluminum handled knife you cannot have a locking surface of aluminum against steel that would be no bueno in a very very short time so instead of milling the aluminum to take a hardened lock face insert in this instance you can still do that but in this instance they cut out the whole section here and they take a couple of screws and they bolt in a section to replace the section they just cut out and this section is steel so you've got steel on steel but it's still just a frame lock that's all it is uh, they just it's just a different way of doing it in this softer material rather than doing a hardened lock face insert and you know what other companies do that lion steel does that they use hardened lock faced inserts on aluminum framed handles so that's uh you know that's an interesting thing in liner locks now my favorite lock is also arguably the strongest production lock type on the market on the production market now i say arguable uh, because there's always a bunch of dumbasses that are going to argue about things uh, but I think it's pretty well um, accepted and understood within the knife community that if you want an absolutely strong locking folder, you want a cold steel triad lock. This is a modified lockback design uh, designed by Andrew Demko and used extensively on cold steel knives this being a recon one clip point and cts xhp green uh, od g10 and uh, it's a recon one but it does have the triad lock and what the triad lock did for the lockback design was much like the uh, the frame lock did for the oh that's not even i was going to say the frame lock compared to the liner lock but really that's not the best comparison i've got out here i should be comparing the regular liner lock to the uh, compression lock because it is a highly modified version of a liner lock whereas the triad lock is a modified version of a classic lockback design now, how did they make this so much better? Well, first, let's look at the depth of the plunge on the plunge tab that's going to fall down into this um, notch that's in the back of the blade. All right, you're going to have that. It's going to fall right down in there. Watch that. Now, see how far I've got to... Okay, right there. Right there is what I've got to clear. That's one of the improvements. They do an extra deep plunge cut in that blade, um, and that gives a lot more surface area for that to lock up on the back of this. I, I don't know what they call it. This is a lock face, part of the lock notch there. Um, the next thing they did is incorporate the stop pin into the locking mechanism. Now, this is going to come around. It's going to come around. You can see the notch is rolling up under the stop pin towards the locking tab on this back lock here. And what it does is it's going to come, it's going to come, it's going to come, it's going to come. The blade is going to lock against the stop bar here the same time that the lock falls into face or place. So everything is locked right up against that stop pin there. And much in the same way that the compression lock has modified the lock position to put everything close together, locking against each other. Now, that is how you strengthen a lock system. And that's much what you find here in this triad lock. 
Now, that's the genius of Andrew Demko. Uh, I love, I admire people, whoever uh, designed the compression lock, uh, yeah, God bless you. You're a genius. Uh, because it takes a special kind of genius to see something like that. Um, at least for me it is. I, I overcomplicate everything, and I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've been working on something and I can't figure it out, and I go to somebody with more experience, and they're like, uh, you just take that screw out. So there you go. I overthink things. But the kind of genius that comes up with a system like this where it puts everything right here, everything right there, and setting up this lock, the, the closer you can get these locking points and self-support and supporting each other, the stronger that lock is going to get. Now, as on blades, um, if the triad lock is the world's best lock, why don't we see it on everything? Well, people don't like it. Uh, first of all, uh, a back lock, a lock back is not tactic cool. Uh, it is not cool at all. It is looked at as an old lock style that is inferior because knives are not what they used to be. It uh, used to be this was a tool and a tool only. Now it is a tool. It's a piece of pocket jewelry. Uh, it has cash a value within the community. Um, I know that if I go into a meet and greet and I'm carrying this recon one and everybody else is carrying a $2,000 custom from the hottest makers in the world, uh, nobody is going to come up to me and hand me a blue ribbon and say, congratulations, you brought the coolest knife at the meet and greet. That's just not going to happen even though it's perfectly fine as a knife. So it's not just a tool anymore. Um, and one of the things that comes with that is it has to be a fidget toy for some reason. Uh, there are literally, there is an entire niche of the knife community that will not buy a knife unless it has a, a very high return fidget factor. Uh, so these guys... They love, you'll see their collection, every knife in their collection is a ball bearing pivot, flipper folder with a frame lock, it's got every kind of coolness to it, uh, you know, it's drop shut smooth, and it's, you know, it's got ceramic this, and titanium that, and mokume this, and zirconium, aluminum, titanium, frangicide, uh, alloy pivot collars, and I just totally made that frangicide up. That's not even a real material. Um, if it was, it would be fucking awesome. Frangicide? Come on. It's made out of franges. So, uh, my favorite is the triad lock. Well, Baz on Blades, why do you like the triad lock? Well, it's hands down. It's the strongest lock type on the production market. I've never had an issue with one. Uh, they self-wear. They wear into a stronger lock position. Now, why don't people like them? Well, they're not a fidget toy. Although almost all of my triad lock knives are set up with absolutely no play in any direction and are still for the most part drop close uh, although you got to get your finger out of there because there is a back spring on this uh, one of the reasons that people don't like them uh, that deep plunge you really got to push down on that lock tab and they've got a very stout spring in them that helps aid in the lock strength so it's not only in the design up here it's also in that deep plunge it's in that higher um, rate spring that's in it and you know what uh, it's a it's a little more physical of a lock i mean that's a lot of having to move a lock bar against some considerable spring pressure um, i could hand this knife to most women uh, unless they are fairly fit or knowledgeable, they would not be able to close this knife. Uh, they would not have the physical strength. You give it to an elderly person, uh, you give it to somebody with a disability, they may not be able to close the knife. And that's one of the downfalls of that knife. But it still, it offers the strongest lock available. 
So which one is it? Is it the triad lock? Um, is it the frame lock? Is it the liner lock? Uh, is it a modified version of the liner lock? Um, you know, is it another triad lock just to get the blue towel wire in here? Um, you know what? I don't know, guys, because I like every one of them. There's no lockism going on here at Baz on Blades. Uh, I like every one of them in their own way. Um, I still prefer the triad lock because it is the strongest. It is much stronger than these other locks, uh, even that compression lock. Sorry, Spyderco fanboys. Uh, but you guys have to make up your own mind. It's great for a discussion either way. So, as always, thank you very much for taking the time to watch one of my videos. God bless all of you, and we will talk to you again.